good afternoon <coughs> good afternoon everyone uh, the professor arindam choudhary who joined us in 2006 uh, faculty member is currently a professor in our department prior to this he uh, did his uh, masters from iit kanpur and i am also of course alumnus of iit kanpur but we have not overlapped he is a very young guy and uh, then after that he moved to carnegie mellon university for doing his uh, phd then he did a, a post doc in columbia university and joined us in uh, 2006 and he works on single molecular <coughs> uh, spectroscopy you will say micro micro spectroscopy microscopy as well as spectroscopy and uh, no so he is a right person and of course i will not read out the names of nobel prize winners because it's very difficult to even pronounce their names <laughs> now with this short introduction i just invite professor harin thank you ravi all right thank you uh, professor rikan for asking me to give this rather challenging lecture uh, because here i am supposed to uh, speak to all of you the general public about why the these three people uh, monji bawendi uh, louis bruce and alexa or sasha yakimov got the nobel prize in chemistry this year and uh, let me start about uh, talking about something completely different uh, this is a cup uh, that is in the british museum Uh, made in the fourth century uh, AD, and it's a Roman Empire. And if you look at this cup, it uh, actually uh, looks of diff- it has different colors if you shine light from different directions. And it turns out that this cup actually contains uh, nanoparticles of gold and silver, and the color changes uh, from the direction from which you see this cup. And a very similar thing is there in uh, the stained glass windows in uh, medieval european churches you see this very wide different range of colors uh, which are actually it turns out made out of nanoparticles and these nanoparticles have different sizes and shape and if you can't see it they vary between 25 or 40 or 25 to 50 nanometers or 100 nanometers and they can have very shapes and they reflect are uh, different colors of light and that gives you this stained uh uh changes of different hues so the point is that these guys these three guys who got the nobel prize this year uh it's a kya kya in logone that used to be the dialogue i remember from long time back about what this nobel prize was about and uh because they have apparently been touted as the ones who planted an important seed for nanotechnology and the citation reads that uh, these guys uh, they are awarded the nobel prize for the discovery and development of quantum dots nanoparticles so tiny that their size determines their i included the word physical the physical properties all right so something happens as you change size and uh, this continues to say that the smallest components called these quantum dots are the components of nanotechnology has now the speed from light you know from televisions and led lamps and also guide surgeons as they remove tumor tissues all right so the my focus actually in this talk to to understand how the color of light changes which is a physical property as a function of this size of this nanoparticles all right so that is what i my focus is now uh, before i even start let me very very quickly give you a glimpse of what is a nan semiconductor nanocrystal or quantum dot they are basically like balls like a football but very very tiny If you can imagine, if you can fill up the entire Earth with footballs, the number of footballs that you are going to get, and each football can actually be filled up with the same number, almost a similar number of these nanoparticles. They are they're so small, and each of these nanoparticles or quantum dots actually contain few hundred to several thousands of atoms inside them. All right, so it's actually a crystal. So to understand uh, the processes that involve light. again i am coming back to light again and again because almost all the applications that have come up involve this emission of light and these different colors of light uh, that these quantum dots uh, emit and they are very very bright and so my focus will be on that and uh, the applications wise before i even go into the details you can see that it it involves light uh, it we have applications of these quantum dots or so nanocrystal semiconductor luminescent nanocrystals in displays and photo detectors and even lasers leds then the biological imaging of cells biological imaging of tissues and that's what you know surgeons can use to actually detect tumors in chemical sensing in photocatalysis to some extent 
in also in energy harvesting, how to harvest solar light, uh, com convert solar light to electricity, that's a, another area in which these quantum dots have been used. And also very recently on quantum information and quantum communication, this is this forms in the realm of quantum computing and quantum technologies. Now before we can understand what even a little bit of what all these things are, we need to first start from basics. And since it's a general talk, I'm going to start with an atom. Now, this is kind of a picture of an atom, although there is really no picture of an atom, where you have a positive charged nucleus and there are some electrons which are around it, as you can see over here. And when two or more of these things come together, you form a molecule. This is, for instance, two atoms coming together and you form a molecule. And if more atoms come together, they can be of same kind, they can be of different kinds, you form bigger molecules and a molecule is nothing but some sort of a mesh of electrons and this nuclei bound to each other, they hold on to each other, they're stable. Uh, when you have these uh, more and more of them coming in, you can see here in this picture, you start forming some sort of a shape. And if this continues, you end up getting crystalline solids. And the crystalline solids essentially have some sort of a unit cell in it, which is a repeating unit. And we all have seen crystals. We have seen sugar crystals. We have seen salt crystals. We have seen stalagmites, stalactites, and many, many other gemstones. They're all crystals which have structure. Basic structural unit is an unit cell which gets repeated. And essentially, this lattice that is formed, so three-dimensional lattice, extends effectively up to infinity. That's what a bulk crystal is, which where you have these atoms and you can actually identify the unit cell inside any of these lattices. Now, um, how does the energy levels change when uh, you go from an atom to a crystal? In atoms, you have these atomic orbitals. And when two atoms form together, they form a molecule. You form molecular orbitals. If more and more atoms join in, you start forming more complex molecular orbitals and they get, you know, they kind of club together more and more. And once you start reaching these clusters or crystals, you see that you start forming bands. And typically, these bands that are there in, in a, a material can be thought of something called a valence band and a conduction band. Again, this is high school knowledge. And this difference in the gap in energy between the conduction band and the valence band, that is what determines whether a material is going to be conducting or it's going to be an insulator or it's going to be a semiconductor. In a semiconductor, the valence band and the, and the conduction band are a, a nominal difference. It's not as high as that of an insulator. So coming back to gemstones and colors, I should mention here that the colors that you see in these various gemstones effectively arise due to the energy absorbed or the light that is emitted after the energy absorption. And that depends on this gap between two energy levels and you relate these energy levels to the difference in the band gap here or for molecules over here, all right? And uh, so if you shine light on some of these crystals, you can also see light emission coming out that this wavelength of light that comes out also depends on the energy gap between the two states or these two levels that you have in the material. Now something very special happens in semiconductors. Semic in semiconductors, when you shine light, you generate electrons and holes, okay? So how do, you, how do you do that? If light comes in, essentially it can pop up if the suitable wavelength of light comes in. I can remove an electron from the valence band to the conduction band leaving a plus charge over here and the electron is negatively charged and this electron and this plus charge which is a hole can actually get attracted to each other and kind of form uh, some sort of a, a bonded pair just like a hydrogen atom where you have a proton and an electron all right and uh, these are called these quasi particles which are called excitons and uh, you can also have loose electrons and holes and these guys in a crystal lattice this is a 2D version of a crystal lattice. They can move around freely, all right? And uh, you can generate in a big crystal many such electron hole pairs or loose electrons or loose holes. And important thing is that these, uh, these particles that are generated, which I'm calling an exciton, this bound electron hole pair, they are transient species. They're fleeting, they don't live forever. While they're moving, at times they will come together and they will annihilate themselves. And when they annihilate themselves, the system comes down to the ground state with the emission of light. Okay, this is the process in which light is emitted. So now the question comes in, how does size matter or does size matter? If you take a sugar crystal, 
It's a very big sugar crystal. And if I take these ones that you can get in uh, Gulmohar, right? You must have all seen it. And if you chop them up, this is the sugar that we typically use in our, in our home. And this is ground sugar, which you use to make cakes. Does the taste change? The answer is no. But does all the properties remain the same? Perhaps not. Because if I think of taking a sugar cube, a crystal, and start chopping them off to smaller and smaller pieces, and they can think of this as a, as a thin, long slice, which is like a flat slice, this is like a rod, and this is like a really tiny thing where you have like chopped it up into very, very small pieces. What effectively happens is a relative surface to volume ratio increases. All right? But this, that's, that's understandable, the surface to volume increases, and that actually has a lot of applications as well. But how does this changing of size affect the optical properties? That is a question. So if you now think of a nanocrystal, which you have made by chopping off these big, big crystals and make them small so that they are tiny, they are in the order of few nanometers to several nanometers, these excitons that are formed, or these electron holes that are formed in these crystals are confined, I'm sorry, they are confined to this crystal only. It cannot get out of it, okay? So once they are confined to this local region, something very special happens. Now what I did not mention to you uh, is that these electrons and these holes and even this exciton, although we call them particles, they're not really particles. They're quantum mechanical particles, which means they have a wave nature associated to it. And when you have a wave nature associated to it, what you're essentially doing is you're confining this wave, electron wave, or this exciton wave in these nanoparticles. So the question is, if I now confine this electron wave in smaller and smaller nanoparticles, does the energy levels change? If it does change, then I should have a change of the light, that of the wavelength of light that is going to be absorbed or emitted. Am I being clear? All right. Now, first year undergraduate uh, chemistry, if you have a confinement of a quantum particle, like a proton or an electron or even a hydrogen atom like this with an electron and a hole, it turns out that the energy levels become discrete. And not only that, the expression, I didn't want to use any equations, but I, this one I have to, turns out to be something like this, where n is a quantum number, and L here, as you see in the denominator here, is, a, is the length of this confinement. So you can see, as I in, decrease the confinement, if I make the L smaller and smaller, this energy level separations are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And effectively, the same idea happens the same thing happens when you have this exciton or electron or hole confined in 1D confinement. That is, you have a flat sheet. It can move around in two directions. Or there's a rod where you can, it can move around in one direction. It's confined from two directions. Or this is like a dot. That means this electron hole pair is effectively confined from all three directions in space. Okay? And that's why these are called as quantum dots. Now, the energy gap, as you can see here, effectively, without going to the mathematics or anything of it, I, I put these equations, but no need to go into it. Turns out that as you go from bulk semiconductor to uh, nanocrystal semiconductor, you start seeing these energy levels split up. You start seeing these discrete energy levels form. And as you decrease the particle size or the nanocrystal size, the energy gap between this gap energy increases slowly as you increase the size of these particles. And this turns out is essentially, if you think about it, if this energy gap increases, and if you're looking at a transition that is happening between this state and this state, or this state and this state, then as compared to the smallest ones, which will have the highest energy, which is going to be blue, in this case, which are larger nanocrystals, you are going to end up having states where the energy gaps are going to be less and therefore the color is going to be red, okay? So that's why these guys are called these quantum dots. And these levels, this discretization of energy levels that you have there is also makes them another term. There's another term that was originally I mean, used or sometimes used. They are called the pseudo atoms because their spectra almost looks like atomic spectra. Now, uh, let me see how much time I've got. Um, all right, um, Louis Bruce, that's back in 1984, he published two seminal papers. And both the papers were in Journal of Chemical Physics. 
And in this paper, what he did, the first paper, he calculated the energy levels of these various kinds of semiconductor nanocrystals as well as bulk and showed how the energy levels which change as a function of size. All right. And uh, this required the usage of an equation which looks like this. Don't want to get into the details of that. But this idea of Lewis Bruce to show this actually stems not from trying to make the nanocrystals. He was trying to look at colloidal nanocrystals, but he ended up making smaller nanocrystals and saw that the energy, the, the, the spectra, the absorption spectra changes. And that is actually shown in the follow-up paper, which came out within a few months or maybe within a week or so, where you can see this is the absorption spectra, this is the wavelength. And as you can see here, if you focus in this region over here, you can see a fresh sample uh, uh, absorbs up to around 500, whereas the age sample actually absorbs up to around, around 400 nanometers, all right? So that is, or maybe I am mistaken, it is aged goes from here and the fresh sample, fresh is here, aged is here. Okay, I've got five minutes left. I'm sorry, I... All right. Um, so it turns out, although he could image these nanocrystals, this is an example of such a nanocrystal, uh, these nanocrystals are unstable. Clearly, if you look at these nanocrystals, at with time, they are basically aging. As they are aging, they're dissolving, they recrystallize, they come together, they form bigger crystals. And if that happens, as you can clearly understand, uh, the spectra is also going to get messed up and it's also going to get broadened, right? Because you will not be able to distinguish between particles which are small and big, right? So that was one of the issues. All right. Around the same time, in fact, earlier, um, uh, Alexei Yakimov or Sasha Yakimov uh, and uh, his student Onushenko, as well as Efros, uh, they uh, were also interested in doing something else, but that was in Russia. He was in St. Petersburg and uh, Bruce was in the Bell Labs in New York, in Murray Hill, New Jersey. And uh, they uh, were looking essentially to make these uh, glass filters. So if you look at any colored glass that you can see, and I'm just going to use my cell phone here. If you look at this glass, if I take it through here, you can see green light, right everyone? And if I do this and use this blue thing, I see blue light. So they were interested, they were working in a company which eventually became short glass company to make different kinds of filters. And the way they would make these filters is to dope silica or silicate with uh, certain uh, chemicals. And he ended up doping with, with copper chloride. And it turns out that he found out that copper chloride, when he made at 625 degrees Celsius, versus when they made with 550 degrees Celsius, these two different temperatures, they showed a different color, not as pronounced as these two maybe, but they were slightly different colors, okay? And he was very perplexed about it. And he figured out by X-ray measurements and many other measurements that they were forming, um, he used the term microcrystals, but they were actually forming nanocrystals embedded or embedded that were formed inside this glass matrix, all right? And this is an example of the absorption spectra that is there for that he collected for cadmium sulfide and for copper chloride. And as you can see from one to two to three as the size decreases, you can see this is the energy scale is actually increasing in this direction, right? So this is as the size is decreasing from one to two to three. You can see clearly this sharp bands, the spectra starts shifting more and more to the blue. Okay, so he essentially also coined the terms quantum dot in parallel, although Louis Bruce didn't know about his work and we do not know whether Alexei Yakimov knew about Louis's work, which came around the same time. Now, one of the issues that was there with these samples is where uh, these uh, quantum dots that were made, they were frozen in glass. You can't really use them for anything. And that is where uh, I think Monji Bawendi came in because he proposed a colloidal route uh, a chemist's route, a solution chemist's route to synthesize and characterize a uh, very mono dispersed. That means uh, particles or nanoparticles with very narrow size distributions. Okay, why is that needed? Because if you have different sizes, then you are going to end up getting different uh, spectral properties, right? And they are also going to get mixed up. You don't want that. And uh, he proposed this hot injection method where you heat up 
uh, the solvent and the crystals are formed and you have some capping groups like you know tri tri TOP or what doesn't matter what this is the structure of it uh, and then you essentially collect different fractions as a function of time and they end up getting these different kinds of crystals with varied with a consistently varying uh, absorption spectra as you can see it starts from indigo all the way to the red entire visible spectra was spanned and if you look at the TEM although this picture is not from his paper uh, you can see how uniform a size uh, of these nanocrystals he could make at a point he, when he took an aliquot at a certain point of time and froze that reaction. And uh, in fact, this method is uh, so nice that even me, I'm in chemistry department, but I often say that I'm a synthetically challenged chemist, so I don't know much of synthesis. And even then, me and my students, or not me, but my students can very, very easily make it. And I'm going to show you uh, uh, an example of that uh, in, in soon. But one thing that uh, Monji Bhavendi also did was try out various different routes, very changing various parameters in which we could, he could make with different sizes and shapes of nanocrystals. Now these uh, quantum dots are so bright uh, and that's also because he, we, we, people have developed this uh, structures which has a core which is emitting and a shell which kind of protects it and it's capped with some organic groups on, on top. And as you can see, as it changes size, this is what it looks like. This is how the emission spectra looks like. Now, how does it, uh, you know, compare to organic dyes? How is it better? In fact, they're much better in terms of color purity, as well as stability, as well as brightness. All right. And here, I would like to show you, Tejmani, do you want to demonstrate it here? An example, you can do it. I think everybody can see it, it's fine, right? These are actually examples of quantum dots of different sizes and we were unable to make the blue ones, but you can see we have been able to make something which is starts from around green back to the red. Okay, and there, sorry, could you do say something? Uh, so, so there's red. So they are actually very, very nice in terms of, what is it? That's fine, that's fine. Oh, it's less intense, all right. If you shine more light on it, more number of photons come out. So this is an example that I want to show you, which is basically showing the same thing over here, but not perhaps the violet and the blue, but the rest of it, okay? So essentially these size-selected nanocrystals, uh, there's this, there are these colloidal quantum dots and the synthesis procedures, right, is, that is that was, that was developed partly by Mohanji Bhavendi, was crucial for nanoscience and nanotechnology. And of course, there was enough room for new further development. In fact, I'm only talking to you about what happened till around late 1990s, which is 30 years back. So after that, a lot of development has happened. In fact, these uh, quantum dots have become so bright, you know, this unimaginably bright, and you can see here these balls of light that I have here from which photon comes in. They have been used in various, various, various ways. I'll just give you one example that was shown in 1996 by Bowendi and uh, Bruce, where they could even collect the light that emanates from a single nanocrystal. And this is a paper that was published in Nature in 1996 uh, that, was, that came out of this core shell kind of a structure of a nanocrystal. And just to convince you, this is, remember, it's 96, technology was not that developed for these measurements. And this is a data from our lab of these nanocrystals. I, we made a few nanocrystals of different sizes and you know not two different sizes slightly different sizes and we put them in on a cover slip and this is the brightness level that you can see very very easily you can see it through your eyes and in fact if you see through your eyes if you visualize them this is what you really see you see different colors in fact without even doing a measurement like TEM you can find out you can figure out what the sizes of these different nanocrystals are just by looking at the light the color of light that comes out of this single nanocrystals. All right, so I'm almost done. So this is one thing that you will find out in the market. It's there, Samsung started it. They're so bright that quantum dots are actually being used to generate this quantum dot LED TVs. And they are used as uh, emitters of different wavelengths of light depending on the size of quantum dot that you have over there. Uh, in, in, in this layer of it, which is excited by a blue UV LED, which also happens to have a Nobel Prize in 2014 in physics. 
and that excites the phosphor and then there's a liquid crystalline display which actually shows you very, very vivid colors. So there have been a lot of applications of these quantum dots starting from cameras, displays, illumination. This has been all realized. Bioimaging medicine, that has also quite a bit has been realized. Partially in energy harvesting and photovoltaics, it has been realized. But there's also several other regions of science and technology where the applications are still going on. We still do not know whether we have, will be able to achieve it or not, but we really have high hopes uh, to do so using, using these materials. And so we feel, I feel that, you know, the future is indeed uh, really bright because of uh, these three guys, uh, you know, Alexei, uh, Yakimov, Louis Bruce, very, very nice person. I personally know him. And uh, Monji Bowendi, who worked with Louis Bruce for his postdoc and IBM. And uh, they asked fundamental questions in physical chemistry and, you know, which eventually led to these uh, discoveries and opened up uh, our door uh, to nanoscience and nanotechnology. Thank my students for doing this and doing the demo for me and uh, also helping Tejamani especially for helping with the slides. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>